welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, and if we know what's happening in the future, we'll tell you. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. And for quite a long time, the Beatles desk at the New York Times, um, and co-author of the forthcoming McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 73, with my co-author, Adrian Sinclair. And I'm with my esteemed co-hosts, uh, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. Um, and he also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio which is packed with Beatles-related interviews and stuff. So you want to visit that. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hey, Darren. Good to be with you guys again. And as Ken mentioned, the other guy down there is Darren DeVivo, DJ at WFUV FM 90.7 in the New York area. Um, he's been doing that since February 1984. That makes him venerable. Um, and if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. All right. Hello. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Beatle friends. Everywhere. Okay. So um, let's see. Today we have actually sort of a, a theme and a half, <laughs> a theme in an EP. <laughs> Um, we'll be discussing Ringo's new third EP uh, or EP three, and uh, we also, um, you know, we've 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 come up with these sort of um, you know recent things, uh, you know, about the albums and and all that, and and just sort of you know strange general topics that I always think we're never going to have anything to say about, and. and then two hours later, we're still at it. Um, so this week's is we each picked three of the Beatles' British singles that we, I guess, that particularly mean something to each of us um, with the possibility of one alternate American single. But before we get to that, we have Ken and the news. Okay, well, uh, some of you might be relieved to know that the news is not nearly as long as it was the last mm -hmm. time. <laughs> but uh, let's get started by talking about, of course, Revolver. Some more detailed information regarding the upcoming box set for the Beatles Revolver album. The new remix of the album was made possible from the new cutting edge demixing technology from Peter Jackson's production company. The super deluxe CD and vinyl versions will house a beautiful book with a foreword from Paul McCartney, an introduction from Giles Martin, an enlightening essay from Questlove, original artwork from Klaus Vorman, and insightful chapters from Kevin Howlett. The big day for that release, as we all know, it's probably burned in our brains, is October 28th. On our last show, we mentioned the many releases, especially from Ringo coming out on Record Store Day, that being November 25th. One of them we brought up was Ringo Live at the Greek Theater. That'll be coming out not only on vinyl, but on CD, DVD, and Blu-ray. This concert was available for streaming on the Coda Collection video channel for Amazon Prime members. Okay, looking forward to that. I always love to watch Ringo's all-star band videos as opposed to listening to the concerts on CD. It's a very, it's very exciting visually. Are all those um, editions coming out on Record Store Day? Because I had not heard about the CD and the DVD as being Record Store Day releases. Maybe they are now. Well, the report I had didn't list that, but I'm just guessing it should be at the same time. It, it might actually, and I could be wrong, the vinyl may come out on Record Store Day. Yeah. And, you know, it'll be gone pretty quickly. They're always, I shouldn't say always, a good number of time, the in-demand titles just are all sold. 
They mm-hmm. disappear. You could go looking around and still find things from past record store days that are available. Perhaps a CD and DVD might come, you know, soon after record store day, um, after the vinyl's been snapped up. Mm-hmm. So um, that's possible. I mean, I, I don't know about all of the configurations. I haven't seen anything about that, but better. Mm-hmm. Better. Well, it would make more sense to have it yeah. after the holiday season. So I would think certainly by then. Okay, an update on that live album from Yoko that we mentioned in our last show called Yoko Ono and the Plastic Ono Super Band, which was recorded in Japan in August of 1974. The entire album is now available for streaming on YouTube and Spotify. It was released on CD in Japan, and there will be a vinyl edition coming out on October the 28th, same day as Revolver. It's called Let's Have a Dream 1974 One Step Festival Special Edition. Okay. The new documentary on the history of Abbey Road Studios, hosted by Mary McCartney, called If These Walls Could Sing, will be running on Disney Plus after it makes its debut at the Telluride Film Festival. It'll feature interviews with Jimmy Page, Kate Bush, Noel Gallagher, John Williams, Celeste, Elton John, Giles Martin, Shirley Bassey, Liam Gallagher, plus uh, also Pink Floyd, and of course, Paul McCartney, and even the microphone custodian of over 50 years, (laughs) Lester Smith. I don't have a date yet for when that will air, but uh, for those of you that got Disney Plus because of Get Back, all the more reason for you to keep it, I guess. Yeah, I keep meaning to cancel it, and now now I have to keep it until that's on. They're finding ways, reaching Hmm. out to Beatle fans. The third and final book from author Chris Engelhart concerning side projects of the Beatles, this one called Beatles Fully Undercovered, um, is now uh, it's no it's uncovered sorry is now out and available for pre-order chris's first two books were called beatles undercover and beatles deeper undercover his books explore songs that the beatles were involved with for other artists either as songwriters producers or musicians the book is available now on amazon and also cg the letters cg publishing Com. I just did an interview with him yesterday, which is now on my YouTube channel, and we spotlight a lot of the recent side projects uh, from Paul and Ringo of the last few years. Some really interesting information in that interview. Uh, the jazz, uh, the great jazz pianist, Ramsey Lewis, passed away on September the 12th, and coincidentally, a new album called Ramsey Lewis, The Beatles Songbook, is being released as part one of the Saturday Salon series from Steel Records. Now, during the pandemic, Ramsey did a series of successful live streams called the Saturday Salon, which is strictly Ramsey on piano, which is where this is from. It's available on Amazon, Spotify, and iTunes. It's 12 recordings from Ramsey with classics like Hey Jude, Here, There, and Everywhere, Golden Slumbers, the Long and Winding Road, and also including Imagine. Ramsey was no stranger to Beatles music. In 1966, his cover of A Hard Day's Night was the number 29 hit in the US. He also had a minor hit with Day Tripper in 1967. And in 1968, he released an album of all Beatle covers called Mother Nature's Son. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke, one of our listeners, who does a Beatles show on Long Island. Uh, for this information. Don't forget uh, two major events coming up right around the corner this weekend, Friday through Sunday. It's the Super Mega Fest happening at the Westford Regency Inn in Westford, Massachusetts. Pete Best will be a special guest all three days there. And the Circle will also be there as well. Pete Best is going to be drumming for the Circle on the Saturday. And there'll also be the Beatles tribute band called the Onos. That's this weekend, September 30th uh, through October the 2nd. And the 42nd annual John Lennon Tribute by Theater Within will take place on October the 8th, featuring Joan Osborne, Willie Nile, and others. It's happening at Symphony Space. That's on Broadway and 95th Street in New York City, October the 8th at 8 p.m. 
And I do believe we have one more news item to mention concerning Alan and that new McCarthy book. Okay, the book comes out on December 13th. And on December 14th, Adrian and I are going to be um, at uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in New Jersey, in Newark. Ken Womack is hosting a, uh, an evening of something. We don't know quite what yet, whether he's going to interview us or whether we're going to do a presentation or, or whatever. And we'll also uh, should have some books to sign there. And uh, it's, it's sort of a rare opportunity if you want to get that book signed by both of us, because um, Adrian lives in Yorkshire. And so this will be, uh, we're only going to be sort of in the same place for a couple of days. So um, we'll sign them there. Um, I think we'll also sign a box of them for uh, Fest for Beetle fans. And um, I guess uh, if there are other retailers that want signed copies, they'll deal with the publisher and the publisher will sit us down at a desk and uh, um give us a, a touch of writer's cramp as, as they say in hard day's night. And uh, so, so that's that um, December 14th uh, in Newark. Um, I believe it's at 7 PM, but um, there's plenty of time between now and then, and we'll get more details as it gets closer. And I would like to make myself uh, available that night, Alan, after all, it's what, two weeks before Christmas, the holiday season. Right. December, what did you say? December 14th. Right. So I'm available if you want Santa to show up. Absolutely. At, at the event. So after the signing is over, Santa could come out and the kids could sit on. Mm. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, it's considered on your lap. <laughs> I, I, I didn't say that. Alan said that. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, I have I have something to add. Uh, there's an event, a uh, WFUV event coming up that no one is invited to. Um, <laughs> seriously, it is, uh, it's an event that just to let folks, uh, to let you all know uh, what I'm doing that I do get out of the house uh, when the sun is out on uh, actually this Sunday, which is uh, October 2nd at Look Cinemas in Dobbs Ferry in Westchester County. Um, this might be something that WFUV does periodically. Marquee members are uh, members who give a, a large, generous chunk of change to be yearly members, and they get invited to private, uh, usually live concerts um, that we might do at clubs around New York City. For example, Rockwood Music Hall uh, is a place that we tend to have our live performances at, but there's some other venues as well. And the idea is that as a marquee member, you get an invite and a plus one uh, for this private event, which is not open to the general public. Tickets are not sold to the general public. And, and uh, we record these performances and then air them as FUV live concerts. Um, membership department at WFUV is kind of looking to branch into different areas. So the idea came up about what about marquee, uh, FUV marquee shows happening uh, at a movie theater with a film instead of a band. So uh, this Sunday afternoon, October 2nd, uh, WFEV marquee members are, have been invited already uh, to come to a screening of Help, which I'll be hosting. Wow. Um, and I don't exactly know what it's going to entail. There'll be a little introduction and whatnot. And then, uh, and then they'll show the film Help and if it's successful enough, and I don't see why it wouldn't be, uh, we'll periodically do these things. Again, there's already been talk about another one involving Easy Rider. Uh, that's to be seen if that's going to come to. So that'll be Sunday. Something I'm hosting that I'm looking forward to is um, this FUV Marquee event. Uh, now, of course, if you'd like to support WFUV and become a member, go to WFUV.org. And all the information about membership is there, different amounts that you can give, different items that you could get as thank you gifts. And that includes marquee membership, the amount you'd have to give. And um, so if that's something that intrigues folks, not so much for this Sunday, but uh, for any, you know, for supporting public radio in New York City, WFUV.org. Uh, go check that. So 
I will have a report on how I did introducing uh, a movie that came out when I was Born. three or four months old. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, with a film like Help, you know, the two of you, I'm sure, would agree with me. If you, if WFEV shows films like that, they could, dare I say it, rule the world. <laughs> don't, don't we don't we rule it already? No. Shocking, <laughs> monstrous. All right, well, that's that's all the news there is this time out. So okay. back to you, Alan. All right. Um, so we'll start with Ringo's EP three. Um, another four songs, just like the previous two EPs, and actually the first one had five. The first one had five. Yep. So the next two were such ripoffs. <laughs> but <laughs> um, you know, and uh, I'll just point out that you know, in, in uh, I think last time I talked about how the revolver set, you know, because of you know the mono and stereo could fit on the same disc and all that stuff, that it wasn't very green. Um, here we have now three EPs from Ringo for a total of 49 minutes and 23 seconds and three pieces of plastic, three jewel cases. And, you know, if you want to complain about it not being very green, it's not very green. But of course, from my point of view, the major issue is that um, having space for three CDs when it could be one CD on my shelves, that's a major issue because shelf space, you know, you get to a certain point, um, you have to start like double shelving behind each other and uh, you don't want to have to do that because you can't find anything. Anyway, um, why don't we talk about the uh, music on this disc and we'll start with, who wants to start? I did enough right. yet. What? I did enough yakking, so. Oh, you did, okay. So you can rest your voice while Darren tells us okay. what he has um, to say. Ring, Ringo could put out an album of, you know, and I'm gonna enjoy it because I just love Ringo. How can you not love Ringo? Hmm. Uh, and this, these four songs are four solid songs, uh, but if there was only uh, one criticism that I want to give it, would give it is that, uh, he's locking into a same, 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 same thing. Uh, and it goes back to what I said some years ago about one of his albums is that at the time of his parting with Mark Hudson, I was ready for a change. Uh, I was ready for uh, Ringo's albums to not sound so Hudsonized. Okay. Hmm. But as the years have passed and we have distance from the Mark Hudson produced material. I do miss what Mark Hudson brought to the table because um, he knew he got it with Ringo beautifully. And he put Ringo in a cast of, char of musicians, of characters, um, whether they be writers or musicians or a changing revolving door of guests on albums. And it really added uh, a, a such a special flavor to those albums that I now miss. Um, at first, Liverpool 8 and what was it, Why Not, I guess, was the one after that. I liked a little bit of the cleaner production, even though I think the production after Mark Hudson was a little hit and miss on Ringo's releases. As we come through the years now, and now we've got these three EPs, I sort of do miss what Mark Hudson brought to the table. Because in the case of EP3, as much as I enjoy the four songs, they don't, there's really little there that stands at, that makes any of these songs rise to the top. Uh, there, there are four, I like them, I'll listen to them, no problem. If we weren't doing this show today, I probably couldn't remember the four titles if asked off the top of my head. Um, because what's, what's the word? I'm trying, I'm trying to get a word. It's, it's, there isn't that much distinctive mm -hmm. stuff going on on EP3. But then that said, if you love Ringo's music, you're going to enjoy EP3. And I feel that... <laughs> This is a record store day release for 2023 sometime. 
gathering these nine songs onto an album. Uh, I just have a feeling that it's going to be suggested probably by Universal. Um, and I think it would make a really good album that would hold its own amongst, you know, some of his uh, time take post time takes time releases. If you combine the three EPs, uh, but like Alan said, um, EPs are a little frustrating. I've always found them a little frustrating because they're a tease, and the amount of money and effort and, and that you put in, you're getting only a quick burst of music and it's over. Uh, but that goes for anyone doing an EP. That has nothing to do with Ringo uh, deciding to do EPs. And I think I understand his logic. Mm -hmm. If he's going to spend a lot of time recording 10, 11, 12 songs for an album and turns around that a fraction of the people remotely interested are buying that album, instead they're cherry picking songs to listen to and moving on, then why make the album? Uh, might as well just put two or three or four or five songs out of time uh, on EPs. and. But I think ultimately the people who cherry pick the song or two they want to hear are going to do the same thing, whether it's an album or an EP. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, I mean, I give EP three my thumbs up. There's no reason not to. There's nothing on there that's unlistenable, that's terrible. It's enjoyable. It's Ringo. The themes of his songs, peace and love, yeah, it gets tiresome. But when all is said and done, there's nothing wrong with peace, love, and throw understanding in if you want. Um, so I, I kind of like the, the uh, contemporary jazz feel of Free Your Soul, simply because it's a different sound on a Ringo song. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Dave Koz, if I'm not mistaken, it's Dave Koz on mm -hmm. sax, and I'm not sure who the guitarist is, but it's really nice. It's Jose a nice Antonio box. Rodriguez. It's, it's, it's a nice curveball like some of the um previous eps had a little bit of a reggae flavor to them um free your soul is uh, sort of like the nice change of pace mm -hmm. on this batch of songs um so listen i give it a thumbs up uh, i don't expect anyone who's marginally interested in ringo or just getting into ringo to run out and buy it it's for people like us it's for the for the diehard hardcore fans and again he's 82 and he has not slowed down a bit in fact it seems like he's getting more active as he gets in his 80s so be thankful that ep3 is there and be thankful that the, at the rate he's going sometime in the late winter i bet you he pops up mentioning his next ep <laughs> okay so. ken well, uh, based on everything Darren said, it opens things up to, you know, <laughs> can go off on a tangent here. But um, I know that I've said in the past that I love the work that Ringo did with Mark Hudson and think along with Time Takes Time as an album represents, you know, the best of Ringo in his solo career, with the exception of the Ringo album from 1973. But um, the thing that I love about when he worked with Mark Hudson is that the songs were really strong. They were all arranged very well. He had a great band with the Roundheads and he added some superstars here and there to help out um, on individual tracks. But they were kind of like a, a bandy album. The Roundheads became a tight band, especially by the time of Choose Love. I think uh, even R Ringo was saying that it was more of a band album. But there's also this, this feeling that I got that you know, so many of the songs were very Beatlesque, and I think that was Mark Hudson's input in there. He said to Ringo, "You know, you're a Beatle; you should be proud of it." Scream it to the heavens! And there are times when I think it was overdone, but still, despite all of that, the songs were strong, which is what matters the most to me. On the other hand, if you're talking about the period following Mark Hudson. One could say it was a more interesting period because Ringo was writing with different people, not just with the Roundheads. You had various people like Dave Stewart, Richard Marks, well, Gary Burr, also from the Roundheads, was in there, Gary Nicholson, um, Van Dyke Parks, Peter Frampton, Todd Rundgren, a whole bunch of people, Steve Lukather, 
And I think because of that, there was a lot more variety on Ringo's albums. And I think that the subject matter uh, changed from song to song. It wasn't all peace and love. Um, and now in recent years, it's becoming more about peace and love and positive messages. And that's where Ringo's head is at. Um, I think that for some people, as great as that is as a message, it can get monotonous. And sometimes it even might even sound a little preachy. Ringo's telling us, you know, how to live and how we can turn our lives around and stuff like that. But given the choice of having this and having no new music from Ringo, I'll take new music from Ringo any day. What I like about the EPs is that Ringo is having a good time. It certainly sounds like it. I like the way that it's produced. The only problem I have with um, the production is that there are times when I think Ringo's vocals sound a little bit distant from the microphone with a little bit, maybe too much echo or reverb. I wish it was more upfront because I love Ringo's vocals. Okay, plain and simple. I, I'm not the least bit embarrassed to say I love Ringo as a vocalist. Um, and I do like the songs. I think that they're well constructed, even if for the most part, it's the same message in every song. The, the song World Go Around, uh, which was written by Steve Lukather and Joseph Williams. Williams is also from Toto. The two of them have been writing songs together and they also uh, wrote Not Enough Love in the World, which was a, a really good song on the previous EP. Um, positive message. I love the words in there. And I especially, when it comes to the production, I love Ringo's drumming on uh, all the albums that that Ringo has co-produced with Bruce Sugar. You hear it more in your face, more and more, and it's more apparent on this EP. And so you get to hear all the fills loud and clear. And, um, and I love all the background vocalists that Ringo has had um, in the last few years. Zelma Davis adds so much to uh, these recordings. I didn't, I didn't know if I'd ever say that because now those female background vocalists add a lot to Ringo's songs and they mix really well with Ringo's vocals much like if you want to go all the way back to oh my my okay you had Martha Reeves on there in the background and some other female singers but it's now becoming to some degree part of Ringo's sound having those background singers um I like all the songs on here except um everyone and everything which is the Linda Perry song it's a song that no matter how many times I hear it I can't remember how it goes it just doesn't stick in my head. But the real um, gem on this entire uh, EP is Free Your Soul. And because of the fact that it has a really nice jazz feel, <laughs> and as I said on the other podcast that I did, Talk More Talk, when I hear the intro, I feel like saying, Smooth Jazz 101 with Ringo Starr, you know, because it certainly fits that format. I can certainly, you know, Dave Koz is one of those artists, you know, it, um, the sound on that, the, the sax from Koz, the, the guitarist that we mentioned, Jose Antonio Rodriguez, the, the acoustic guitar that he's playing is so clear. It's really pretty. And it's a light breezy song and Ringo's vocals fit really well for that. So to hear something that's different for Ringo, you know, you know, I would call this, you know, light jazz, smooth jazz. That was a nice surprise. And I don't go into Ringo's new releases thinking that this is going to be some album or EP that's going to set the world on fire. All that I'm looking for are songs that plain and simple I enjoy that are just good songs that are, you know, done very well in terms of vocals, in terms of arrangement, instrumentation. And most of the time I like the songs that Ringo gives us. Maybe not every single song, but most of them. And um, I'm just glad that he's still doing this. Um, if this is how he wants to do it, four songs at a time, once he gets four songs done, he's ready and go out very quickly, fairly quickly. And um, like I said, I'd rather that he keep doing this than not release you know, anything at all. I just wish that, especially if you like um, any of this new material or so much of the material post Mark Hudson uh, that he would do those songs live with the All-Stars. Mm -hmm. You know, not only that, but as I've said many times, 
so many of the songs that are on Ringo's post Mark Hudson albums have members of Ringo's all-star band in them. If you've got Steve Luker there in there and uh, they wrote a song together, we're on the road again. And here he is, Steve Luker in the band with Ringo and it's a great rocker and it would, I think, do very well as a live song. Why not do that? You got Colin Hay writing a song called What's My Name, <laughs> which Ringo shouts out in every single one of his <laughs> concerts and he's in the band. You know, it's a perfect setup to do a song like that. Ringo seems very proud of the music that he puts out today, but he doesn't feel like that should be part of the all-star band shows. That's that's something entirely different. Just play the songs that everybody knows, which is a shame because he's put out so much great material. The most recent uh, song uh, on the, um, well, two songs that he does on this current tour are photographs and I'm the greatest. And that's 1973. <laughs> I wish he'd do something later than that, you know. Anything from time takes time on, I'll be very happy, you know. So, um, and even in the stuff in between from 74 up until time takes time. But I really enjoy this. Three of the four songs especially uh, really work for me. And, um, and that's about it. I'm glad that it's out and I hope he keeps making more of them. Okay, I guess it's me. <laughs> um, okay, you know, if he wants to do it as an EP, maybe he could put them in a, you know, thin cardboard slip case so that, you know, you have more shelf space to put the three on. Um, <laughs> not to mention materials. Um, I don't understand what he's doing with this division between live and studio work i mean he definitely is into the studio work and i understand why he's into the studio work you know these things are work to put together um and especially you know he's doing a lot of it in his home studio um there are a couple of other studios listed here as well but you know it's it's not like it's not like you just sort of go in with the band and play. Uh, no one does that anymore. And, you know, now there's, it's, it's been for, for decades now, multi-tracking and adding and, and, you know, tweaking and doing things. Um, you go to that kind of effort. Why not play it? You put out a thing with only four songs on it and you're on tour. You should be playing all four of those songs. You know, I mean, it doesn't, take that much of your concert percentage wise it shows that you believe in what you're doing which we sort of know he does but um i, I don't understand the bifurcation between you know this part of me is an oldies act and this part of me is a working musician putting out new stuff you know i i i, I don't understand why he doesn't integrate those two i mean he obviously he he must have thought about this and have some rationale um, and perhaps, you know, when someone interviews him, they should ask him that. Um, and uh, one, one thing you can't forget that's easy to forget is that a Ringo concert for Ringo alone is like a third of a concert. Right. So he's got to share the spotlight with members of the All Star Band. So that reduces what he can put out there and perform even more, squashing out back okay, so on Boogaloo or. Yeah, what but, goes on and 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 the newer things don't have a chance then why he contradicted that in recent tours and kept performing anthem even though that was no longer on a, a recent album that i didn't understand when he had you know something new so, right. i'm surprised what's my name has not become a go-to song on right. these last couple of tours you, uh, have, you have to think that colin hay wrote that thinking that it would be yeah. You know, and also we're on the road again. You know, you, you, you write songs like these, you're kind of expecting them to have a life of their own, you right. know, uh, in concert. Um, but anyway, about these four songs, World Go Round is, is catchy. It's well played. It's well recorded. Um, all of these songs are well recorded. Uh, very good sound. Um, although, you know, since we've brought up the Mark Hudson uh, era, 
Um, what I liked also about the Mark Hudson era was the variety um, that he brought to these albums. You know, every every cut was not like every other cut. It was, you know, he would do different things. Um, every every part of the album had a distinct personality. Um, and it's it's hard to say that with these things, you know, with the exception of Free Your Soul because of uh, Dave Cos and Jose Antonio Rodriguez obviously has a completely different personality than the rest of these. Um, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, you know, to me, if if you say, smooth jazz, you might as well be saying Andrew Lloyd Webber, I'm out of here. Um, that said, you know, uh, about halfway into the song, Dave Cause's sound sort of abandoned that smooth jazz sound and got a bit grittier. And I liked that, mm -hmm. you know, and I was happy that he did it. Also, um, I thought Jose Antonio Rodriguez's playing was just beautiful. Uh, nylon string guitar. I really enjoyed his little solo in there. It wasn't very long, but it was was nice. And and it's an important part of the texture of that song. I like the idea that Ringo is doing something that pushes his boundaries a bit, but that's only one of four songs. So that's only 25%. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I'd have liked to have heard some experimentation on you know each song, make each song a bit different um, and play them live <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically that, you know, Ringo's voice. Uh, I've, I've talked about this before. There's, you know, Ringo has an extremely recognizable voice. We've been listening to on at least one cut per album all our lives. Um, and it's very characterful. It's not, uh, you know, as, as he said uh, the first time I interviewed him in 89, you know, I'm not out there trying to be Pavarotti, you know, and I'm not trying to break anybody's brains. Those were the two things that he said that, you know, really characterize everything he's done since 89. Um, he's not trying to break your brain, you know, okay, now he has this peace and love message. And, and I, I have no objection to that. You know, there are people with much worse messages than that, um, that we hear every single day. Uh, but you know, um, I, I, I think his voice, you know, it has that character. If you like that, if you like his voice, you're going to like any of these things that he puts out, which I, I guess the three of us all do. Um, and if you don't like it, you know, there's not going to be much you can do. Uh, so, you know, it's it's Ringo. Uh, it's it's like that thing that that Paul says in the anthology about the White Album. You know, it's the Beatles. It's the White Album. Shut up. It's Ringo. It's his new EP. You know, he could put it out on, you know, maybe with a thin slipcase. Um, and he could maybe save them all and put them on one album. Um, but OK, fine. This is what he's doing. He didn't consult me. <laughs> one more thing. You know, I, I may have said this before, but for me, the interesting thing about following Ringo post Mark Hudson is that he's done so much songwriting with all the people that we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this uh, new EP, there's only one song that mm -hmm. he co-wrote and that was for your soul. Right. And that's, you know, an excellent song, but um, it could very well be that with the EPs because of the pandemic, he probably couldn't get all those very same people that he, that he collaborated with as a songwriter in the studio with him course everything could be sent digitally too yeah, but yeah, that yeah. could have something to do with it i always find it interesting whether you know he's trying to to uh be groundbreaking which i'm not expecting from ringo or to try to do something different i still find it fascinating when he writes with different people because the subject matter is different the styles on those post uh mark hudson albums song for song is different the production is similar but, he, but the songs are about different subjects. So, you know, I like his writing with Richard Marx in particular um, and Dave Stewart, the, really all of them. And um, I'd like to see him write with either some of those same people or start to write with other people. It's nice that Linda Perry is, is sending 
uh, Ringo songs like she had Coming Undone, which was a really good song on the previous EP. But again, she's not writing with Ringo. Might be more interesting to me if they were tried to write something yeah. together. But, you know, Ringo has done quite a lot of work now as a songwriter. And it's a shame that there's a lot of people in this world who only know him as a Beatle. And he wrote two songs in the Beatle days. And to a lot of people, there's not much else. But he's done quite a lot of songwriting in his solo career from Vinnie Poncia to Joe Walsh, Mark Hudson, the Roundheads, and all these other people. And he should be acknowledged somewhat for that. And I wish that he would just put a little bit more effort into the songwriting and either, like I said, try to find new people like Sam Hollander. I mean, that's one that we haven't mentioned before. Right. Uh, Tango, Tango is really a very good song. And Sam Hollander also uh, co-wrote one of the songs here. I think it was Let's Be Friends. And so, um, but that's not with, with Ringo. He wrote that with Bruce Sugar. But that's what I'd like to see from Ringo to try to keep writing and writing with different people. And I find that alone to be interesting enough. You know, he, he got more involved with songwriting, even though he wrote a decent amount in the 70s with Vinnie Poncia. But really late in the game, starting with Mark Hudson, he became very involved with songwriting. And I'd like to see him continue to do that, whether it's with EPs or, or albums. Yeah. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, so we're all set with Ringo then? Yes, we are. Okay, <laughs> and that is... Three. <laughs> Darren DeVivo, official thumbs up. Me too. <clears throat> okay. That's so, a cool cover too. We're waiting for Alan. Thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just take this opportunity to just get a topic for a split second, folks. I want to apologize for Alan's t-shirt. Okay, <laughs> If any of you are offended in, in any way, the Yankees are the <laughs> Beatles of baseball teams. Oh God! Let me get my world's smallest <laughs> violin out. The only blemish on his record. We're going to forgive him for this. So you know, he's a great writer, great speaker. Just concentrate on that. <laughs> no. <laughs> and and, he, and uh, as a present to Alan, someday I promise you, we're going to get Andrew Lloyd Webber on this show. Oh no, we're not. <laughs> yes, we are. Anyway, so. Topic two is each choosing three singles. Um, do you, do you want to um, talk a bit about what was behind the idea, Ken? We needed another topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I know people like countdowns and top threes and top fives and top tens. And, um, you know, I enjoy them probably more so than ever, even though when it comes to the Beatles as a group, sometimes it's so tough. There's so much great material to say what you think is their best album or their best single. Uh -huh. But um, we haven't really talked much about the singles here on this show. Right. Um, so I thought it might be a good idea if we were only concerned or mainly concerned about the UK singles, um, which would be our top three. And even there, it's so tough to pick three. But um, I have a fairly good idea knowing knowing your taste, Alan, what your number one will be. But mm -hmm. I think that uh, two and three for, for, for you and uh, for Darren, or all three, I'm not sure quite what Darren would say, but it might be interesting. Might not. <laughs> As I said on my own channel, Ken Michaels Radio, we did a show where I had uh, four guests on and we picked what we thought was the, the Beatles' best album in the UK. And I said at the very beginning of the show, if we all pick the same album, that's a very strong statement to itself. Hmm. But if we all picked a different album, that's an even more powerful statement because it tells you how solid all throughout their catalog those albums were. And if you can make a case for every single Beatles album, if you think A Hard Day's Night was the best Beatles album, as one of my guests did, John Montagna, then mm -hmm. that's fine too. But you could do the same thing with the singles everyone's got different opinions and they're all valid so i always find it interesting to hear different opinions maybe we should take a minute to um you know discuss a, a bit about how they regarded singles as opposed to albums because they really did think of them in most cases as completely different things it wasn't so much a question of um let's take a couple of tracks off the album and and put them out as singles i mean they they 
uh, with only a handful of exceptions, the singles tended not to be on the albums. You know, in that meeting, in that meeting of September 1969, when they're talking about, you know, their new way forward and the four songs for each and three for Ringo and, and, uh, and everything. One of the things that came up was uh, talking, John, John talking about Paul's, what he called granny music, um, meaning Maxwell and Obladi in particular. Um, and saying, you know, this is the kind of stuff that, I mean, you, you should probably be offering it to someone like Mary Hopkin or someone else, you know, who needs a song and wants to do that kind of thing. Um, or if we were putting out a single, it's like that, that's the kind of thing we would put out a single. It's not the kind of thing we need to have as an album track. And the thinking behind that is kind of interesting, you know, on an album, we can do what we want and we can think of the album. I mean, we're thinking of it as song by song, but we can also think of it as the whole thing. We can think of it as more experimental than we can do on a single. Um, and yet that makes it sound like they value the albums more than the singles, whereas it was always sort of a big competition among them to be on the single and not only that, be on the A side of the single. You know, I mean, they were, uh, think about um, on the BBC um, appearances that they did. There was one where uh, I think Brian Matthew says, uh, yeah, you know, I, I like on the new single, I feel fine. And she's a woman. I like she's a woman just as much as I feel fine. And John said, I don't. You know, <laughs> I mean, he's definitely pushing this like I am the A side and Paul is the B side. So there was there was like always that kind of, that whole tension about about that and about, you know, what should be the single, because the single was it was going to be like the herald for the album. And even if it wasn't going to be on the album, it was going to indicate, you know, maybe in a more um, concentrated way what the Beatles were up to, you know, at, at, at a particular time that, you know, the album's going to come out a week later. And, and based on what you're hearing on the single, you get a sense of the, the mood of the album in a way. Anyway. You know, it's interesting what you said about the September 69 meeting, because here they are, they just finished Abbey Road. And what did they release as a single at the time? two songs that were on Abbey Road in the first <laughs> place <laughs> come together and something. Yeah. So, scratch that theory about the single having to have to be separate from the album. Well, is there any truth to something that I just recently tripped over um, that John wanted something issued as a single, which would break the, probably was, uh, I don't even know if it was a rule, but the pattern of not releasing singles off their albums, but break that by putting something out for the purpose of putting George in the spotlight mm -hmm. with one of his songs on the A side of a single, not to give George an A side, but to give George the spotlight with a song that could thus open up a path for a solo album or a solo career. I guess at that time, maybe being a dual career because the breakup wasn't necessarily yeah. yeah, it was still very vague. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if that actually was Lennon's thinking and why ultimately EMI agreed to release, probably did not have to agree, but probably said, all right, let's put something out as, the, as a single. Um, I think John wanted to encourage George at that point. I think John was in, you can even see it a little bit in the, um, <clears throat> in the Get Back film when um, they come back after the meeting. And John and Paul are talking and uh, John says, you know, basically he's hurting and we're not giving, we didn't give him any, anything to make it better. And I kind of think that John, you know, John sort of a lot of the time positions himself as a, you know, tough guy and says, you know, the reason the Beatles were so big is because we were the biggest bastards out there. Um, and he likes to think of himself that way. And yet you see these little things like that conversation in the Get Back film and his pushing for something to be on a single. 
as uh, more sensitive than he liked to admit being. That's what I think was behind that. I've always found uh, singles versus albums in the Beatles world to be a little confusing. But that's probably because what Capitol put out in the United States often conflicted with what the Beatles wanted to happen and what was getting released by Parlophone in the UK. Right. Combined with the fact that, I, you know, being younger, I'm learning about the music. I was learning about things um, after the fact, after they had been out in the 70s, mm -hmm. trying to figure out, oh, wow, why would this be on like in 1979 when I ran out and bought rarities brought it home and realized oh wait this is a british album and look at the songs that are on it and go half these songs ain't rare <laughs> not rare because in the united states they got they were on albums right very confusing to the point where i've actually made a list which i periodically update just to remind myself this song was on this u.s album this UK album, not a single, but because it gets a cla it gets all cloudy. So I don't know if this is true, but every UK single was released independent of the albums, every one until something. Well, except for you know, like Hard Day's Night and Yellow Submarine, and uh, um, there were a few. Oh, there's a few exceptions scattered in there. Can't buy yes. uh, there are a few exceptions now in the u.s you had <laughs> singles coming off of albums and you had albums that were built using singles um so that made it you know even like wow ho, ho. you know capital would get grab three three singles with songs that the beatles didn't intend to be on albums capital would use these songs to fill outside two of a full-length album and I'd get the album in 1976 and for years know these songs as being album tracks only to later find out, oh no, they were B-sides of singles and they're rare. Right. You know? well, that is always to this day kept me like my head spinning when it comes to what's a single, what well, wasn't you, a single. If you want your head to spin more, Consider that in the summer of 1965, they put out the Help album in England. Capital in the U.S. took Yesterday and Act Naturally and put them out as a single and then built an album around that single, Yesterday and Today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and then you don't know, was that considered a non-album track or uh, uh, I say potato, you say potato, let's call the whole thing off. I give up. I can't figure any of this out. Um, and, so then, and then you've also got a case of with the US and the UK, they put out the same A sides, but the B sides were different. Right. Mm. Yeah. So, but um, it is interesting in a way because you mentioned when it came to the movies, A Hard Day's Night, Help, and Let It Be, that the singles came from those albums. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yellow Submarine, you really can't count since. The single really came out from Revolver. Right. And there's a case of an album, yeah, where the single Yellow Submarine and Eleanor Rigby came from the album. Why that way? Yeah, because I think, you know, they had already put out Paperback Writer and Rain as a standalone single. Right. Um, so don't know why they put out Rigby and Yellow Submarine, maybe just because they were about to tour and, and not play those songs live. I guess Ringo has, you know, some history here. You know, the Revolver was the start of it all going out on tour and not playing a single song from the album. Mm -hmm. But Which they did Paul, play Paperback Writer. Paul actually, as when the 70s set in and he was solo and he had wings, was really the only Beatle who consistently juggled singles, at least for the first half of the 70s, albums and singles. And if a single came off an album, that was fine. But there would be a standalone single coming. Uh, at some point until, uh, you know, the mid 70s when that, that started to slow down. And a lot of bands, it's not just the Beatles, of course, don't need me to say this. A lot of, a lot of bands, it was the same situation. Discographies in the UK and US between the Kinks or the Stones Man. or the Who. 
Right. It was the same thing. It was the record companies ultimately more times than not calling the shots with things like that. Um, so, you know, with Paul, um, look at Band on the Run. I mean, he recorded like Helen Wheels was like the second or third thing he recorded for that album, but he didn't want it on the album. He thought mm -hmm. of it as a single. Um, Capital persuaded him to put it on the album and he agreed to do it just for the US. And he had, he took the whole position of, you know, I don't think singles should be on albums. And yet he had released My Love as a single from Red Rose Speedway. Um, so he was a little inconsistent about it. And then after Helen Wheels, when, uh, you know, Band on the Run had this weird chart history, as the two of you know, because you care more about charts than I do. Um, <clears throat> it kind of started going up and then Capital went to him and said, you know, we could keep this momentum going if we released Jet mm -hmm. as a single. And, you know, and by now Paul's argument about not wanting to take singles off an album is beginning to weaken um, because, you know, Helen Wheels, it didn't ruin the US version of Band on the Run exactly. Um, it sold quite well here and, uh, uh, and then after Jet, um, they came back to him again and said, we should put out Band on the Run as a single. And by then, I don't think he was arguing at all anymore. You know, he just just did it. Um, you know, later in his career, it was more a question of, you know, you'd get something like My Brave Face from Flowers in the Dirt, but the B-side would not be on anything. You know, right. he did a lot of that. And then, and, and then it got even stranger because... He would put out B-sides, you know, on CD singles in Japan only, <laughs> you know, so you'd have to get the American one for this B-side and you'd have to get the Japanese one for this B-side and the British one, you know, so. He was doing a lot of non-LP B-sides early on. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. From you know, country dreamer and the mess and all that. I, I know what Alan means. It almost became... See, the, by by the time Flowers in the Dirt was out, the change in the music industry was underway. And in the 80s, to me, it was um, the, the, the emergence of the CD and it was the record companies trying to push cassette sales to cut down on home taping. So now suddenly singles weren't just seven inch records or two songs on them. They were singles that could have three and four songs uh, clouding what exactly was a B-side. Uh, and CD singles then came out. And then for an hour and a half, you had the three inch CD single. Yeah. Um, right. Where you had to get the little adapter or have a tray in your player that you could just sit the three inch disc in there. Um, and so by, by CD age, by the second half of the eighties, what a B side was and what a single was, was very clouded. And I remember WFUV, during a short period of time when I was assistant music director, I would get all hung up on uh, if a, a label put out an artist, uh, put out a single, and it was a, it was a, an item that was going to be sold commercially. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't compiled and issued for promo purposes. Um, is this a single with extra tracks? Is this an EP where the songs are all equal? Um, is it a single? Is it an EP? Is it a CD? five so what a single was went out yeah. the window by the flowers in the dirt time and paul would then do what alan said that was when the b-sides would become and the c-sides would become all of these non-album tracks yeah um whereas in the 70s it was fun to see that the b-side of the single is a song that's not on the album it wasn't always the case but it happened from time to time. Mm -hmm. Well, the CD singles from Paul, especially during the off the ground period. Yeah. Amazing time. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that even was driving me a little nutty because I'm like, why don't we just make it simple here and put a double album out or I guess the expanded, the special edition wasn't in yet. Except in Japan. In Japan, it, it you get a like, double album of, of Off the Ground and, and the second album would be all the B-sides. Right. You, you had to be the, a member of a fan club or get a magazine subscription to be able to keep up with the fact that um, 
in Bermuda, they've released a special single uh, where the B-side is intentionally backwards. I, you know, it was getting crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you either had fanzines like Beatle Fan or Good Day Sunshine or uh, Beatles Monthly, which I relied on, or later on, Steve Marinucci, all the news that he gave on the Abbey right. Road website and Beatles Examiner and stuff like that. That's how you found out about a lot of this stuff. And if you were lucky, we still had local record stores that yes. dealt with import CD single, mm-hmm. and they'd be the first ones to get this stuff. Yeah. And I remember when I had my show on WDHA in New Jersey for 10 years, I had a, a local record store that gave me prizes to give away. And he kept up on all these import CD singles and 12 inches and all that stuff. Yeah. And I gave that stuff away. So if you were lucky, you knew locally a store that that um, that dealt with all these releases, yeah. the imports. So. So, Darren. Yes. What are your three Beatles singles? What singles? <laughs> no, uh, t- you know, the, tell you the truth, when, Al, when, uh, when Ken suggested this topic, um, I just picked up a pen and wrote them down, and that was it. it was, there was no thought involved. What I feel are the best. Now, I took it from, this is me saying, these are the ones that I pick that I think are the best. They are close to being my favorites, but I think these are the best. And to me, there was no debate. Concentrating on UK singles, but these three singles were also US singles. Capital wasn't messing around with these singles. Okay. No messing around from Capital. The number one single, I think, is the greatest single ever released, the Strawberry Fields Forever with Penny Lane, the concept single. Mm-hmm. And, and to think that this kind of goes back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. They record, they go in, we're going to make a new album, we're going to make new music. They record Strawberry Fields Forever. They record Penny Lane. They record When I'm 64, The Record Company Wants a Sing. All right. Here's Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. Cross those off. Wow. That's confidence in your abilities. (laughs) You know what I mean? Cross those two songs off. We'll just come up with two others to replace them. (laughs) It was never given. It was never. The thought was never entertained that Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane could still remain songs targeted for the next album, let them come out as a single now. Because today, that's what would happen. They'd come out, people would play them, listen to them, the radio would play them. It would, you know, from months. And then the album will come out. Mm -hmm. You know, there's artists today, going back to talking about EPs, that'll put out EPs, and then in a year and a half, put a full-length album out, and the damn songs are on the EP or on the album. Anyway, uh, so uh, my first pick is Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. It's, to me, that's a no-brainer. It's the greatest single ever made. Uh, and I actually technically still don't know which one's considered the A-side. Because there's an A-side. It's a double-sided hit. No, but... no, no. There's only one side. There's one side and there's one side. They're not the same side. I and and also... Penny Lane is... was treated more as the A-side than Strawberry Fields was. You think so? That was... Penny Lane was the bigger hit in the U.S. All right. Fine. I'm not arguing. So I'm just trying to. Okay. Uh, number two for me uh, is one of the first Apple releases. It's Hey Jude and Revolution. That single itself was uh, uh, was innovative and if for no other reason. This is a seven minute song that you're putting out on a single, even if it was on the B side. You're putting a seven minute song on a single completely and utterly unheard of, except MacArthur Park, right? <laughs> which was generally the same time. I never remember. Before, it was before Hey Jude, but it, I, I'm pretty sure it, was, it clocked in under seven minutes. OK, I think. Um, the Beatles want to put a seven minute song out as a single. They put a seven minute song out as a single uh, and. You know, you, you never heard people discuss the single. They bought it, the quality of the sound of the single. They squeezed the seven-minute song onto a seven-inch record. It sounds like crap. It didn't. And the Beatles went ahead and did it. And then put a song on the B side of the single that was 
intentionally distorted. And what would be the case when I was a little kid, more times than not, my single sounded like crap. I'd play them on a little phonograph. Half the times they were warped when I'd bring them home or, or the pressing was bad. Uh, if singles were coming out today, I'd end up in a loony bin because I'd be exchanging, exchanging, exchanging till I got a perfect pressing. Mm -hmm. You put out a distorted song as your B-song. I mean, you know, and, and not to mention that these are two of the more important Beatles songs ever, period. Uh, coming out on the spinning apple. The whole thing about Hey Jude Revolution made that uh, a no-brainer for me for number number two, my number two single. Number three, maybe a little more is my taste. Uh, to me, it's the perfect example of power pop is Paperback Rider with Rain. Um, you know, you, 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 have, you talk about all these great songs, the Beatles have come up with, and then you hear Paperback Rider and Rain and you go, son of a bitch. You know, those two songs are better than what I was just heaping praise on. Killer songs, great rock songs, the start of power pop on a single, both sides, Paperback Rider and Ring. So those are my three picks for the best Beatles singles, UK releases, but they're also US releases. And my little, uh, you know, US pick, unique to the US market, um, I, that I found a little tricky. Um, cause you're like, oh, the B side, that's a good B side. That was a good B side too. But, uh, uh, so I went with the one that started it all here. I want to hold your hand back with, I saw her standing there. That's a powerhouse of a single. Uh, in fact, I actually think I saw her standing there is a better song. It's a more powerful song. Uh, it is actually a pre power pop song. Um, and that was a, a, a monster combination that Capitol did right in, in late December 63. And it started it all. And here we are talking to screens about this music, you know, thanks to those two songs. Yep. So those are my pickings. Hmm. Hey. Hey, Ken. Before I mention my top three, I want to ask Darren a question. Hmm. Why is Paperback Rider and Rain the start of Power Pop? I always thought it was. That doesn't. No, no. You're right. To me, that for me, that was when I, you know, going back through the '60s. Because I'm such a Beatles fan, because so much of what power pop was, especially in the '70s and '80s, it was mm. so Beatles derivative, and to some extent, almost all of it, even the little bit that I hear today, is so Beatles derivative that I automatically just my ears went. Paperback Rider Rain, 1966, that's where it all started. But I'm not taking into consideration that what some of the things the Kinks might have been putting out hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, or you could make a long list, I'm sure, of things that you would say, Darren, I don't agree with you. And I'd say, you, you, you know, you're right. I get it. You know, it's just yeah. something I do in like raising my fist and talking about how great a single I think Paperback Rider and Rain is. And, oh, they are the, they are the bedrock to what would become known as power pop. So power pop to you is poppy and commercial, but edgy. Edgy to a uh, bad finger in the seventies. Right. Big star in the seventies. I always go to those two bands. I love bad finger. I love big star. Mm -hmm. um, I get a little angry sometimes when everybody bows at the big star altar. When I say you first have to bow to the bad finger altar, then big star. <laughs> but to me and the raspberries, a lot of the stuff that Raspberries did um, and Todd Rundgren early on in his solo career. Those are some of those early albums. They can be challenging albums, but there was always these, you know, couldn't I just tell you moments. Yeah. Uh, that to me is power pop. And, you know, then it becomes an interpretation of what you, you know, it, there's no, there's no, you know, scientific science behind it. I can understand when you combine the pop and, and the edginess why you would say the kinks. I mean, certainly you really got me all day and all yeah. those songs. But then why why would Paperback Rider and Rain be the start for you and Ticket to Ride isn't, you know? Or I don't know. I don't, I don't think of Ticket to Ride as, but why not? It 
sure as heck R. could R. be. Snipe. All of these upbeat Beatles songs from the mid '60s, you could make, you could say, Darren, shut up. It's not, it's not Paperback Rider and Rain. What about? Did Anya Bird can sing "Beat Those Two? Not quite, but um, although, I'm yeah, here. not quite. But Anya Bird can sing's another one that I think of at the same time. Hmm. But. Um, yeah, all right. So just you can keep poking at me that I mentioned power pop and point that out. I just want to understand your logic. That's all. There is no logic with me. Don't you know that by now? <laughs> but um, I, to me, though, it is. Uh, and, and I have a copy of that Capitol single. And that just explodes off the turntable. Uh, those two songs, the way they just re are reproduced off uh, old, old seven inch vinyl. OK. All right, my top three, there are no right or wrong answers here. These are all great choices. But I knew going into this that I knew what my top two would be. The third could be any number of singles. It's very tough. But they're all so great. How do you say Paperback Writer and Rain is better than uh, We Can Work It Out in Day Tripper? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or uh, Get Back and Don't Let Me Down or something and Come Together, you know? Um, the, the choice for number three is, is the toughest of them all. And it could change on a dime here. But I would have to say, based on my taste in recent years, I might go with The Ballad of John and Yoko and Old Brown Shoe. Good, good picks. I love The Ballad of John and Yoko. You know, and funny thing about that song is that we all know that it was such John and Paul that played everything. Growing up as a kid, I never knew that. No. It could have passed as all four of them on that record, but I love the whole storyline between the whole thing. And, um, you know, I love the instrumentation. I love Paul's drumming on it. It's rock solid. And I love the buildup for the last verse. So I just think it's such a, an incredible song, a very underrated song. Some people want to diminish its greatness because it doesn't have all four of them on it. But I think I think it's just as great as so many songs that the four of them did together. I really think it's uh, you know a great song, and "Old Brown Shoe" is a song that I've really over the years grown to love more and more and more. It's such a great catchy song. It's a good rocker. You know, I love that repeated guitar riff from George. I love the piano part, the drumming on it, which I guess apparently is Paul according to Kevin Howlett, anyway. Um, and again, the song- On Old Brown Shoe? Yeah. He said that in the Abbey Road booklet, that they were both recorded the same time when Ringo was doing the, the Magic Christian. A lot of people debate it. You know, it certainly sounds like Ringo to me, but if you look at the Abbey Road book, his notes, Kevin Howlett said it was Paul on drums. So um, just love those two songs to death. But then again, I could just as easily go with, you know, the ones I mentioned. Something and Come Together. I mean, Something is a song that I really, I always loved it. I love it more now than I ever have. When she realized not only what a great song it is, but what the Beatles put into it as musicians, how all the parts were so important and the orchestration that George Martin added to it, was, which was so understated. Such a perfect, perfect recording. Great love song greatest love song George wrote during the Beatle years. Um, but the Beatles as a group added so much to that. Um, the top two, the thing is, um, you know, to me, they could be tied. It's not so obvious, but it's the two that you mentioned, Darren. Very often I'll say, hey, June and Revolution's number one, but I could just as easily go with Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever. I mean, hey, Jude, Ironically, even though I'm very affected by airplay from radio, I never get tired of that song. I never get tired of Hey Jude, even though it's played so much. It's been played so much on the radio. One of the greatest melodies ever, one of the greatest vocal performances ever. I love the feeling of, you know, brotherliness in the group and the, you know, the nanas uh, at the end. I think it's one of the greatest songs and recordings ever done. Um, I also have some very fond memories of hearing Hey Jude on the radio when it came out because my family just moved uh, from Brooklyn, New York, where I was born, to Long Island. And in the summer of that year, 
um, in our backyard, we'd play the radio a lot and we'd go from one top 40 station to another and one would be playing the beginning of Hey Jude and we'd go to the next top 40 station, they'd be playing the coda of Hey Jude. <laughs> so it just saturated the airwaves so much because it was such a big hit and seven minutes and 11 seconds long. And Revolution is one of the greatest rock songs ever. Um, love the vocals, love the screaming in there. Nikki Hopkins' piano part, which adds so much. Um, it's one of their greatest rockers, without a doubt. And then you can make the case in point for Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. I mean, Penny Lane is one of the most perfect pop songs that's ever been written and recorded. It isn't just the song itself, it's the whole arrangement in the song and the brass and everything that George Martin brought to it. Um, I mean, it's such a well-constructed song overall. And, um, and like you said, Darren, a concept single, um, you know, songs evoking memories of, you know, your childhood days in Liverpool from both of them. And one of the best examples, if not possibly the best example of the competition between John and Paul, how they rose to, to put out their best songs together. And Strawberry Fields is, um, you know, an amazing song and an amazing production. And with all the work that was put into it that we all know about with two different versions of two different speeds edited together and how that all worked and all that George Martin brought to the table with the arrangements with, uh, you know, the brass and strings. And it's just such an incredible accomplishment and so different sounding for its time and for a single and so dreamy. <laughs> you know, it's one of the greatest psychedelic songs ever so um to me it's really a tie it's very tough for me to say which is better um for the longest time i've been saying hey jude and revolution but really and truly to me it's a tie okay now watch alan say the exact same top two i guarantee you <laughs> well, well no i mean here's the thing i had figured i'll listen to the two of you and then i'll just choose three other ones except i cannot not choose strawberry fields and penny lane because I, that would be number one too. i kind of agree with with darren that it's you know probably the, the greatest single ever ever made by anybody i don't know if, i don't know if that's that may be an exaggeration but um but i really love that single uh everything about it um and, you know, I mean, I remember as a kid when it came out, you know, and listening to Penny Lane on the radio all the time, originally with the trumpet ending, mm -hmm. um, which was the promo. And then they withdrew it and suddenly we're not hearing the trumpet ending. And then there's Strawberry Fields and what the hell is going on in that song, you know? Um, and I've, you know, since obviously had a lot of time to sort of work with them, listen to outtakes, all that stuff, um, which only increases my appreciation of what they were doing. I mean, in the case of Strawberry Fields, it's not just the two versions they used. There was a third version that they recorded and didn't use any of. And then there were, you know, all those Lennon demos going back to Spain, you know, where he's got, you know, basically one line of the lyrics and some chords. And so, I mean, that turns out to be an example of a, one of the, the, probably the best example of where we have recordings from every single stage of its composition and, and finished recording. And we can follow that thing from beginning to end. Um, and seeing as it's one of my favorite Beatles songs, ever i mean i couldn't have chosen a better one to have all those those recordings of um and you know it's it's also a case of you know seeing how the sausage is made doesn't make you want to not eat the sausage in that case mm -hmm. um so penny lane in strawberry fields was no matter what you two guys said was going to be my number one um pick um i had also you know i mean there were so many I, I, I thought of doing Paperback Writer in Rain because that was the first Beatles single I bought with a blue picture cover and the whole deal. Um, feel very close to that one. Um, but so instead, I'm going to do We Can Work It Out in Day Tripper. 
we can work it out in day trippers. First of all, there's something a little bit melancholy about both of them. You know, the music sort of isn't, you know, I mean, we can work it out if you just think of the music as, is, you know, it's, it's, it's brisk and it's bright and it's, you know, but there's something sad about it, you know, I mean, it's, it's a fight, we, you know, we can work it out, we have, there's, there's something to have to work out. So you've already got a situation that's a little bit tense. And then you've got that business of John's in the middle, the, the, you know, life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting, um, you know, and in, in a certain way, Paul always said that, you know, John would be the one who would come up with the little sort of acerbic, um, you know, middle later, the acerbic uh, counter thing to what he was doing. But actually, John's is in, in a way the less acerbic one. It's like, yeah, you, know, you know, OK, there's a fight. Life's too short. Why should we fight? Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's actually sort of a, a brighter outlook that Paul is bringing to it, which is, you know, try to see it my way. And, you know, there's, there's no, I'm going to try and see it your way. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, but so, so there's, there, there's that bit of wistfulness in that song. And then Day Tripper as well. You know, that one is uh, is one of John's, you know, so here here we also have this opposition of, you know, Paul on one side, John on the other side. Uh, and John's is, you know, it's a little bit ambiguous. What is Day Tripper about? Is it a, you know, trip in the drug sense? Um, is is this about is it about a girl? You know, it is it about it, it could be about a number of things and you can't quite get your hands around it except that whatever it is it's kind of you know here now and then it's gone you know and that's a little bit melancholy too in a way you know uh it took me so long to find out i found out you know um and yet there's in both of those songs wistfulness or not a lot of energy a lot of you know great playing. I mean, Day Tripper. You've got a, a an actual riff that you know, as a kid playing guitar, everyone needed to learn that that mm -hmm. riff. So you know that. Yeah, I, I kind of think also that with Paul, with singles that had a Paul song on one side and John on the other, you had this kind of uh, you had this interesting opposition. A lot of the time and in in terms of penny lane and strawberry fields penny lane bright easily accessible pop okay there were complicated textures in it there was that trumpet solo there was you know in the flutes and everything it wasn't just a rock band playing the song it was more complex than that but it was a bright happy beautiful melody strawberry fields forever is you know, totally the twilight zone, you know, and it's, uh, you know, John being a completely different kind of songwriter than Paul is. Um, in a certain way, Day Tripper and, and We Can Work It Out has a bit of that. And my third one was, this. Is, it, it, it seems almost prosaic, but it was just Get Back and Don't Let Me Down. As stuff from the Let It Be album goes, I mean, those were two great tracks, which I, I think um, we appreciate even more now that we've seen Paul come up with Get Back From Nothing, mm -hmm. you know? And, and Paul always says, or at least he actually said in an interview with me, and I think I've seen him say it elsewhere too, that he never recognized Get Back as a big deal. The other one, others had to persuade him that that was the single, but, you know, Get Back is like it was the perfect song for that project. The idea of, you know, they really wanted to get back to their roots, play live, uh, you know, and Get Back, it's it's just the perfect song for that. The textures are perfect. The, the, the song with the sort of story, Jojo and Loretta and, you know, Again, in this case, we have basically the whole history of that song. We don't have to have demos because there are no demos. We saw, we saw Paul just start, 
he's drumming his bass and singing get back and and suddenly you know they've got a song except they're still a long way from here to here there's still that business which i'm so happy that um that uh peter jackson included in the film because it's just one of my favorite moments from from the get back let it be sessions which is you know i've got it jojo left his home in tucson arizona is tucson in arizona yeah it's where they film high chaparral it's just great also, the, the thing where it started out is, you know, part of their parody of the British National Front and racism, where it originally was no Pakistanis. There was originally a verse about Puerto Ricans. Um, and I think they sort of came to understand that they're not known as a satirical band. They're not Tom Lehrer, you know. Uh, and if they put that out, it can be misunderstood. We don't hear them really discuss that in, in the thing, but they're, it seems sort of clear that those lyrics weren't going to fly. And so we have them with Jojo and Arizona and the, and the whole deal. And then finally, you know, but the, the finished version of it, it just sort of cooks in a really nice way. And, you know, when Derek Taylor put out his press release for it, you know, the, the, the Beatles as nature intended, that was just perfect. And it was, and it perfectly described what they were trying to do in the Get Back project. Um, but they succeeded here. And then the other side, don't let me down. You know, you've got John doing one of his. And, you know, what is his big concern at the moment is Yoko and his relationship with Yoko and his not wanting to be let down. And, how that relationship is going and um it's a it's a great song it's a beautiful song um it it uh it balances get back really well so those two so, so i've done three now right yeah mm -hmm. and i was of course going to pick i want to hold your hand and i saw her standing there as my american uh alternate single um but darren's already done that one um but what what he said about it was absolutely right i mean that was a perfect pairing it was a much better pairing really than i want to hold your hand in this boy because mm. i saw her standing there was so strong um but so as I want to hold your hand, you know, I mean, that was an incredible single. In those days, you know, you used to get singles and the B-side was usually just sort of nothing. The Beatles had a totally different approach to that. The B-side was usually just as good as the A-side one way or another. So what I'll do um, for my alternate is I'm going to skip the A side of this one. It was the same in both the US and the UK and the B-side was you know my name, look up the number. That is just brilliant. And if they couldn't release Life with the Lions on a single, <laughs> this is really even better. Um, you know, this was a track they worked on for a couple of years, you know, occasionally taking it out, adding another bit, putting it back, taking it out, adding another bit. And it's, uh, you know, when I got the Let It Be single and, and put that on, you know, that wasn't a song you were hearing on the radio. And it was just so weird and zany, you know, nothing like anything the Beatles had done before. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if John had had his way and could have put out that song on one side and uh, what's the new Mary Jane on the other side, <laughs> how that would have gone over. But yeah, uh, you know my name, look up the number. I think it, it just gets special um, mention. So, so I get Let It Be and The Long and Winding Road mixed up. Which one came out first? Let It Be. Let it be. And The Long and Winding Road was the second single then? In America, it wasn't a single in the UK. Yeah. Because I always thought it was interesting to, if, if Let It Be, and because uh, I think of those two songs, those two singles sort of together, those were uh, those are the first things that I remember hearing on the radio when they were new, and I had those records. Uh, so they kind of get. I never remember which came first, but if Let It Be was the last single that the Beatles would release, uh, if you want to look at the B side as being the thing you listen to second, that would have been one weird way to end it all for the Beatles. 
mm. that I I I I, I uh, <clears throat> you know my name. Look up the numbers being the last thing that they put out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, my theory, a- my theory was that um, Long and Winding Road came out as a single just because Alan Klein wanted to annoy Paul. Um, because it wasn't announced as a single until after Paul objected to the string arrangement on it. And it was sort of, oh, and by the way, we're putting it out as a single. So, so, so perhaps the Beatles' plan of attack was that Let It Be would be their, well, <clears throat> Let It Be would be their last single. Well... You know, if Alan Klein was the one that instigated the release of The Long and Winding Road right, as a single, and that wasn't necessarily the plan of attack that the whoever within, whoever made these decisions at that point uh, yeah. within the band and Apple and, you know, um, Let It Be was thought, all right, this will be the single, the, last, the only single from the album. Mm-hmm. And what the future is going to bring, we're going to have to see because John's there and, you know, uh, then maybe they were thinking, let's put something off the wall on the B side. Right. I would have thought somebody at Capitol would have made that decision about the long and winding road. He could have well, taken could... a suggestion from Alan Klein, yeah. you know, but I, I'd be curious to find out because the Beatles, everything, just about every single they released went either number one or top 10. Um would you know my name look up the number have become i can't imagine it being a number one record but maybe just on the strength of the beatles name alone and the uniqueness of it being so radically different for them could it have gone top 10 i don't know well think of this as an alternate universe the beatles have put that out as an a side it being the beatles it got played all the time and then everybody started making records like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and see, maybe we got to do, we have, somebody has to explain to me. And, and, and if maybe someone wants to email or, or message me, do it like simply like you're writing to a five-year-old. Um, what made the distinction of, all right, this single is going to be a double A side single. There had to be a decision made. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, how... Um, um, uh, George is my sweet lord and isn't it a pity was clearly released at least in the US with the double whole apple mm-hmm. because it, the two songs were meant to be treated equally although again uh, you're talking I'm five years old I don't ever remember hearing um, isn't it a pity isn't on it a pity on the radio but it might have been it was my sweet lord was that was the song Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then how Billboard, if you look at charts, if you look at lists, you'll see where Billboard will include the B-side as part of the hit. Get Back and Don't Let Me Down was a number, well, that's UK, wrong column. Okay, where's the US column here? Okay, yeah, so, you know, you have like a case where I don't think of uh, something like Baby, You're a Rich Man being a charting song. It charted. But in the United States, it was a top 40 hit. Yeah. Number 34. What made it so that the single was selling because of the B-side getting played? Did, Did radio stations stop at some point emphasizing all you need is love? And how about the times when Billboard would have the singles kind of t- listed together as A and B sides, something and come together, both number ones. It can be very confusing. Yeah, I, I never understood that. But I'm pretty sure that um, We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper went out as a double A side, I think, um, at least in the UK, because the Beatles yeah. wanted it out that way. Yeah, that's they, how it's listed here in the UK. A number one right. two songs as opposed to two separate entries. It but is very for, confusing. For many years, it wasn't until Come Together and Something, all the double sided hits um, would chart separately. Now, the sales obviously for these singles were exactly the same. It mm-hmm. all came down to airplay. 
and that determined where each one was placed. Yeah. There's a lot of singles, especially from Elvis Presley, where both the A side and the B side charted separately. Um, but for some reason, and I don't understand what it was, I need someone that knows the history of all this. It wasn't until Come Together and Something when both were considered a double A side hit. And it's for that reason that both those songs are on The Beatles One. Both of them are listed as number one or number one songs. Here's another one. Uh, in the United States, both The Long and Winding Road and For You Blue were number one hits. I don't think of For You Blue as being a number one, but the way it's listed here on Billboard's uh, Hot 100, that single was a number one. The single. Well, For You Blue didn't even chart on its own, but it's listed here as like, you know, I mean, the way this list I'm looking at here is they have the they have the peak position for each song separately. So um, yesterday, one act naturally 21. I don't think of act naturally as a hit, but it was a hit yeah. in America. Um, Here's the thing. I mean, this this is only going to confuse all of us even more because we've always heard the Beatles in the U.S. had 20 number one singles use the word singles. Because of Come Together and Something were both number one hits. They really had 21 number one songs. At least that's the way that I look at it. You know, if you look at the, the, um, the solo careers of the Beatles, George Harrison had My Sweet Lord, uh, Give Me Love, and Got My Mind Set On You were all number one songs. So he had three number ones, but do you really count Isn't It a Pity? as part of the, you know, then, then you have to have four number one songs, but nobody looks at it that way. I think everybody thinks it's My Sweet Lord that was the number one hit. We've got to get someone who is an, a bigger chart expert uh, on this show. I mean, I know where they, where they charted, but it, it, the, the explaining of it all can be a little bit confusing. There were times, because I, I love following the charts, like in 1975, um, John Denver had a double-sided hit with the song I'm Sorry and Calypso. And I think that they're both considered, because it went to number one, both of them are number one songs. So it has happened probably not that often at all. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it is confusing. I wish I could say more about it, but I know that the starting point for all this in the U.S. was with Come Together and Something. Okay, so there we have it, our um, our look at the Beatles singles, um, other ones we could have picked. It's all great stuff. And uh, But for this time, maybe we'll revisit this and, and have to each choose all three different singles. But let's just go around and give everyone our contact information and all that stuff, um, starting with Ken. Okay, first of all, let me grab something here. Excuse me? Coming very soon to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, I will have a special contest in which you could win a jigsaw puzzle right here. This came out a few years ago. And it's called A Magical Mystery Tour of 100 Beatles Songs. Mm -hmm. There's 3,000 pieces. Wow. Big saw puzzle. Yikes. And you will find 100 Beatles songs that you can find once it's all done. If you're into that kind of thing, I'm going to be giving away three of these through my website. And there'll be a special contest that will run from October 4th through the 10th. And usually when I have a special contest that just involves writing down songs that I post on my special contest page of Beatles songs, sometimes it's solo, this time it'll be Beatles. And if you write all of them down and you email them to me, three people will I'll randomly pick and they will win that, uh, that jigsaw puzzle right there, which was done by the artist Tom Mass. So make sure you check out my website starting October the 4th for that contest and that's at kenmichaelsradio.com i want to remind everybody that on john's birthday october the 9th um there is a, an internet station uh from canada and 
and they're an oldie station. They play tremendous, a great selection of oldies. And it's FM 108. And they're going to be running 24 hours of my radio show, Every Little Thing, as a tribute to John. Uh -huh. Some of the shows will be Lennon-based. So you'll get a taste of that show, Beatle music, solo music, side projects, like we were talking about before, novelty records, cover versions of songs, thematic sets. Sometimes my own personal interviews uh, are worked into the show. But if you never heard my show, Every Little Thing, before, this is an easy way to hear it because on October 9th, they're running it all day long. Don't have to listen at a specific time. Just go to the station. And that's at FM 108. The number is 108. FM108.ca. Um, on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget, every single week there's Beatles trivia. And you can win one of 10 great prizes, including that new book from John Lennon's uh, defense attorney and the Morris Levy case. Um, and it's called Lennon, the Mobster, and the Lawyer. It's a great interview that I did with, uh, with Jay Bergen, the lawyer, on uh, my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Uh, speaking of which, I just did an interview with Chris Englehart, who, as I mentioned in the news, just released his new book, Beatles Fully Uncovered. Did I say undercovered before? It's uncovered. And it includes all the Beatles solo projects from the group years to the solo years. He put out two previous books. And what he's done is take all the information from those two books, updated information from that time, added all the new entries, put it all into one book. And it just came out. And we talked about a lot of the recent side projects, especially from Paul and from Ringo, some things from George Harrison, where he played slide guitar, another artist that you may not know about. Side projects is, is part of the Beatles history that I am very fascinated with. And as I said in our interview, it's a whole other world. And Chris even said some of George Harrison's best slide guitar work is what he does for other people, <laughs> not just for himself. Yeah. So, um, again, that's at Ken Michaels Radio and on my other uh, Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast next Monday, which will be October the 3rd at 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, we'll mark our 100th show. All right. So we've been on since um, the start of when Egypt Station first came out. And so we're going to be doing something that we did for our 50th show, which we'll, we'll do uh, a Rack Our Brain show. That's when we invite 25 of our listeners and they'll be live with us on screen. And they will be asking us any questions that they want that are opinion related questions on the Beatles. It's not trivia questions. How we feel about certain things, Beatles and solo Beatle wise, our feelings about the Beatles, maybe feelings about the show that we do. You know, but we're we're actually going to have 25 of our listeners or viewers be a part of that. And that'll be on our YouTube channel. So check that out. Talk more talk, a solo Beatles video cast next Monday, which is October the 3rd at 9 p.m. Eastern time. OK, and please subscribe to all these channels. Ken Michaels Radio, Talk More Talk. And of course, things we said today. Hey, Darren. All righty. Uh, you can listen to me at WFUV um, weeknights, Monday through Thursday only, not Friday, starting at 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And on Saturday afternoons, 1 until 4 p.m. at 90.7 FM in the New York City area and 90.7 FM HD2. Um, we're in football, college football season now, and WFUV broadcasts Fordham University football games. They, they tend to always interfere with my time slot on Saturdays, but you could still hear the music. I think if you go to the HD2 channel, 90.7 FM HD2, which I just mentioned, or listen online and on our app, um, you'll hear the football game on the main 90.7. That always still confuses me sometimes. But uh, there's a bunch of different ways to pick up FUV. So if you're in... The New York City area, you got 90.7 FM and the HD2. But outside, listen anywhere at WFUV.org or on our app. Again, I'm on uh, 10 p.m. to 2 in the morning, uh, Monday through Thursday, and uh, Saturday afternoons 1 to 4. Uh, and look for me on Facebook. That's a great way to be in touch with me. 
I go through these periods where I bombard Facebook with all kinds of facts and stuff like that, that I'm sure many people are going up to use. What's he writing about now? Um, but I uh, two Facebook pages, Darren DeVivo, you send me a friend request or like or follow the other page, which has got a longer name, Darren DeVivo, WFUV, DJ and Beatles podcaster or something like that. Hmm. Something sometimes those pages are unique. They have stuff that's not on the other, but um, so it's double the fun or double the boredom, one or the other. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, so you can find me um, most easily on Facebook. Um, I've got two pages: Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. We also have a McCartney Legacy Facebook page where, you know, occasionally we'll put up a little article about something and people get into discussions about it. Um, uh, you know, Richard Buskin has a uh, podcast called Buskin with the Beatles, and I periodically turn up on that. And lately, Richard has been playing a bunch of the interviews I did uh, writing about the Beatles for the Times. He's done a few of my McCartney interviews, a few of my Ringo interviews so far. Um, this week uh, is part one of a Derek Taylor interview and part two will be coming soon. So, you know, we, we, we talk about them before uh, he plays excerpts from them and um, you know, they're, I'm, I'm revisiting them now the same as anybody else. So like, I haven't heard them in, in 20, 30 years and it's kind of uh, interesting. It was a good time. Um, so you might want to check those out. That's Buskin with the Beatles. You can email all of us here at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Bizarrely long name, one word, things we said today radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. We have two Facebook pages for the group, um, things we said today, as you might guess, and also things we said today, Beatles radio fans. But one I thing that's easy to do on our Facebook pages is find the shows where we post right on Facebook. We usually post the YouTube version because that's video spiffy new and you can see this fetching Yankee shirt. Where? Um, <laughs> you can see this Met shirt. Oh, nice. Yeah, there you can. go. All right. Hmm. For once, Darren doesn't have his Mets cap on. So. No, I have nothing. I mean, I have a shirt, but there's nothing on it. Hmm. Um, so we hope you're watching on YouTube. We hope you subscribe to us on YouTube. Um, you can also find us on Podbean. Podbean sends them out to iHeartRadio and Apple Music and everything else um, if you want just the audio version. Um, so there are plenty of ways that you can get us. And anyway, so there it is. And for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>